in a world where carbs are your enemy, you need one man to help you fight your battles. That man is Jimmy. Combating nutrition, disinformation, and general bull. It's Jimmy Rants. JimmyRants.com. Looking for whole food supplements for your ketogenic lifestyle? Then let me introduce you to Further Food. Go to furtherfood.com and you'll see that they source the highest quality ingredients on the planet. They have collagen peptides and my favorite, the gelatin powder to make those yummy gummies. And all of it is sourced from grass-fed, pasture-raised bovine collagen from Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay. This is really high quality collagen and gelatin. There's no hormones or antibiotics. It's non-GMO and it's the most tasteless and easiest to use on the market. If you're not using collagen and gelatin, you need to be adding this to your ketogenic lifestyle. Collagen will help you curb your carb cravings. Again, head on over to furtherfood.com, enter the coupon code JIMMY at checkout and you'll get 20% off your order. Elevate your wellness. Further food. What's up, what's up, you guys? Welcome back to another Instagram Live. And we're here with another episode of Jimmy Rants. JimmyRants.com is the website. If you want to engage live in the content, you got to go follow me. I'm over at Instagram Live. I'm at Living Low Carb Man, L I V I N L O W C A R B M A N. Once you're there, you can engage live in the content, just like all these beautiful people coming in right now. Thank you guys for being here today on Jimmy Rants and get your questions ready. We're having an open Q&A session today. If you missed the live, you can watch it on replay for up to 24 hours. After 24 hours, it does disappear. So pop on over to YouTube, type in the keyword search Jimmy Rants or youtube.com slash living low carb man. You will find the show. Finally, the best of the best moments of this here show. We make a podcast about it. It's called the Jimmy Rance Podcast over on Apple Podcasts as well as Stitcher. All of these links, you guys, are at JimmyRance.com. Sue B says, I've been missing you. Well, Sue, I miss you guys too. I really do enjoy doing these Jimmy Rants. Uh, but let me do my opening. Today's Jimmy Rance. See, I don't feel normal unless I go, today's Jimmy Rants. It's kind of like I would never start my podcast without going, what's up, what's up, you guys? Welcome back to another Instagram Live. That's the start, the Jimmy Rants. Or, hey, hey, guys, we're back here on the Living La Vida Low Carb Show with Jimmy Moore. You know what I'm saying. So, anyway, welcome, guys. We're going to do an open Q&A today. I have not uh, done one of those in a while. I have been traveling like a madman literally since May. Uh, Before we got home from this trip, we have been home five total days at our home here in South Carolina, five days since May the 1st. So now we're down for, we're here a week and a half before we go again, but uh, so, uh, and I did a whole bunch of fasting videos twice a day for about two weeks. So I took a few days break, I was still traveling, got home yesterday. And so this morning I did a Jimmy Rance video all about um, whether you keep the weight off that you lose on a fast. So I am your vessel to ask questions to. So you know you have questions about keto. You know you have questions about uh, cholesterol. You have questions about fasting. I'm pretty much open to whatever questions you want to ask. If you want to ask me personal questions, that's cool too. Um, If you want to know anything technical about how to do a podcast, how to do content online, what it's like to be famous online, ask away. I want to see what you guys have to say. So thanks for being here. You might uh, notice uh, if you've been paying attention to my social media this week that I have been participating in this five-day ketosis challenge where I am testing my ketones and posting them. Um, And so go check those things out. And a lot of people are like, wow, the levels of ketones are lower on you, Jimmy. And they're kind of shocked about that. So this is a common thing. And I wrote about this earlier on Instagram, but I'll re-articulate it here. So especially in the morning, if you see a lower ketone number. So for me this morning, my blood ketone was 0.3, which traditionally 
uh, we would say is out of a state of ketosis. But I think the more that we have an understanding of what that means, and the more that physiologically I was not hungry, I was not tired, I was not feeling bad, I had great energy, brain health on point, calm mood, all of those things are signs of robust ketogenic metabolism, okay? So even though the meter showed 0.3, that was what was in the blood. Your goal, if we're being honest, your goal is to get to a big fat zero on your blood ketone meter and yet still have all those benefits that I just listed out. And so the fact that I was at 0.3 means I was pretty darn close to the number of ketones I was producing and the number of ketones that my, my body needed to use were almost a one-to-one -one ratio within 0.3 um, on the meter. So I saw it as a very good thing. And then I tested it again this afternoon, by the way, just posted that on social media. And it had gone up to, uh, well, here, let me show you on screen what it had gone up to. This is the number that I got this afternoon, 84 blood sugar and my blood ketones at 0.7. So they get higher during the day as your body, uh, as you're living your life, your body is creating ketones. So the best test for how keto adapted you are is when you look in the morning, and let me see if I can find that morning reading. It's here somewhere. Oh, there it is. That was the morning reading. So it was 0.3, uh, did it right around 5.45 this morning, tested that, and so people, oh my gosh, 0.3, that's out of ketosis, and really it's not. Um, not in the context of someone who's been in nutritional ketosis since 2012. I've been hot and heavy. Uh, I was one of the very first people that ever started testing for blood ketones. You're welcome, by the way. Those those strips were five or six dollars a piece. These from Keto Coach are like 50 cents a piece. So you're welcome. <laughs> the fact that I uh, was one of the first people that did it. But 0.7 this afternoon, I feel great. I've got the energy, blood sugar 84. It means good things are definitely happening on the front of being keto adapted. And I want you to not chase numbers on a meter unless you're chasing a blood sugar number. I do think your blood sugar should definitely be in the 80s or below. But I, I don't want you to get so obsessed with, oh no, it's only 0.7 and you discourage yourself when your blood sugar is 84 and you feel great and all, you're getting all the benefits simply because you are a, a slave to that number on the meter. And of course, you know what I think about the scale. It's a lying liar that lies. And I would say that if you're that caught up in the technology discouraging you, then maybe you're somebody that should not use the technology. You should just do this and look for the physiologic signs that you're doing well. That's probably the easiest way for someone with that mentality to keep their sanity. All right, let me get to your questions. Just thought I'd address that here at the top of this Q&A. Lisa says, do you ever miss a non-keto food if out in a social outing? Sometimes I do for special events. Is that normal? Not a craving, but just a social mindset. Great, great question, Lisa. And you're going to hate me because there's no such thing as a non-keto food. And there's no such thing as a keto food. Stick with me here. I think we have so gone down the wrong path labeling foods as keto. And if you're a fan of Keto Coach Lauren, she actually just did a whole uh, IGTV all about this subject. And she articulated so many points that I thought were just really, really good. Uh, so go look up keto underscore coach underscore Lauren on IGTV. And she just did a phenomenal job of explaining this. But at the end of the day, food is not keto. Keto is a metabolic state. And so what you're trying to do is get in that metabolic state where your body is efficiently using ketones. And the way you do that is by keeping the food, if you're going to connect it to food, low in carbs, moderate in protein, and high in fat. That is the definition of a ketogenic diet. But I'm not a fan of looking at these keto foods. And I'm going to answer your question here in a minute, but I'm off on a little bit of a, a mini Jimmy rant because I think we 
too often put this onus on food and claim, well, it's not a keto food. Well, what's a keto food? For one person, may not be a keto food for another person. I think about fruit, for example. There are some people with a strong insulin sensitivity that have a great fat metabolism that they could eat you know, a whole bunch of blueberries or strawberries, maybe even an apple, and still be in ketogenesis. Whereas someone with more insulin resistance, maybe a little more body fat on their body, um, and a lot less insulin sensitivity, has that exact same keto food, and they knock themselves out of ketosis, they get hungrier, their blood sugar goes higher, So I think the notion of identifying a food as keto or not keto, we got to get out of that. And again, I'm not trying to pick on you, Lisa. It was a great question. And I do want to answer your question because I know what you're asking. Um, But I just think we have to get away from identifying foods as either keto or not keto. Food is food. And your body's metabolism determines the ketoness of Uh, what happens when you eat that food. So I hope that answers that part of your question. But I know what you're talking about. You go to a pizza joint, right? So all your buddies are eating pizza. What do you do, right? So in that example, you get slices of pizza on your plate, unless you got celiac or something. Um, And you take a fork and you scrape off the toppings and you eat the toppings. That's how you do it. I'm trying to think of any situation you could be in when you're at a social outing, you're at a special event, and you're around food and other people are eating that you couldn't pick something off that would be keto-friendly. I think we just psych ourselves out because, well, I'm not eating all the junk with them, so therefore I'm... No, you can eat what you eat. And I think we make it harder than it needs to be. Now, if it's a get-together where people are bringing a dish, then by all means, make a keto cheesecake. Um, by all means, bring your own kind of dish so you at least know, all right, my dishes I can eat, and then I'll pick from the rest. You always gravitate to the meats. You always gravitate uh, to the cheeses. Um, you stay away from the carby things, and nobody's any the wiser. Plus, I would dare say that if you're out with friends, they know you're doing this keto thing, right? So it doesn't have to be this... Um, mindset where I have to eat those carbs in order to socialize with these people. You could socialize in the midst of being on a fast. We just came off of doing a seven-day fast last week, and I know plenty of people that fast and still go to social outings and still gather with friends, and that's cool. And I, I think you just, you make your choice about what you're doing for your health, and what, what anybody else happens to say, it doesn't matter. It's not about them. And if it is about them and they make a big deal out of it, maybe you should reassess who your friends are. Right? Hope that answers your question, Lisa. Thank you for that. Sue B says, I had double neck surgery in May, but stayed keto through it all. Wow, double neck surgery. Yikes. Christine has had three neck surgeries. She had three in four years where they went in through the throat first, And then the second time they went in through the back of her neck. And then the third time they did another laparoscopic up here. uh, And it was just, yeah, I was like, please just stop with the neck surgeries. Um, And thankfully it's been a little while since she's had one and she's back to doing this again. So So guys, if you're just joining us, we are doing an open Q&A session about keto, fasting, cholesterol, uh, being famous online, podcasting. Pretty much whatever's on your mind, I will help answer your question. It's been a little while since I've done kind of an open Q&A session Jimmy rant. So we're doing that for you guys here today. Val says, not a question, but my brother was recently diagnosed type 2 diabetes. His doctor told him to cut out the bread and sugars and then recheck in three months. I told him he had a good doc. Yes, never let that doc go. The fact that the doctor realizes this, but guys, what you may not know is going on behind the scenes is there are so many of you wackadoodle ketonians out there that are going to your doctor who had type 2 diabetes you're coming off of drugs you're coming off of insulin you're losing weight you're stabilizing your blood sugar you're getting your fasting insulin levels down guess what 
they're paying attention. It's becoming more mainstream. And through that mainstreamness, doctors can no longer ignore this. I know Dr. Ken Berry talks about this a lot in his work of guys, if you want to impact your doctors, do it. Do it on the down low. And then when he asks you what you did, tell him it's keto. And if the more of us do that, the more of us talk to our doctors and say, hey, look, I did that keto thing. And look at all my numbers. They cannot deny the powerful changes that happen when you embrace keto and you see blood sugar and insulin change and your weight change. They're going to notice. And I think a lot more doctors are taking notice. We should rejoice in that. We should continue to tell our story. And yes, you're going to get a few bad apple doctors out there who will dig in their heels and, you know, that, you know, whatever you believe be damned, they're not going to listen to you. But thankfully, I think most in the medical profession, they only want to see their patients get better. And if patients are getting better eating keto, then by golly, they're going to take a closer look at keto. And some, like this Dr. Val's talking about, might even say cut out bread and sugars. It's a beautiful thing. Keto Purple Al says, why am I sleepy after eating? Well, there's a lot of reasons why that could happen. Generally, uh, it depends on how much you eat. Um, but fatigue following a meal could mean a lot of things. It could mean you have some kind of a sensitivity to something you ate in that meal. So that could cause the weakness. Also, uh, there is this thing called reactive hypoglycemia that even some people that eat a low carb ketogenic diet can suffer with. And I deal, I dealt with this when I was only low carb keto eventually normalized it, but reactive hypoglycemia is where you test your blood sugar before you eat let's say it's 90 and then you eat even a keto friendly food for me it was like eggs and chicken i had and uh what they call the postprandial number one hour postprandial that 90 went to 71. well when your blood sugar dips that quickly um, it can produce a lot of side effects including sleepiness tired hunger um, and a lot of things so a lot of moving parts to that question you're asking, why am I sleepy after eating? But reactive hypoglycemia is a big one. Uh, so yeah, get that checked. I would also get a full hormonal panel run, especially like thyroid numbers, because that also can be a sign of, uh, of being sleepy, can be a sign of, of thyroid issues. So go get that checked out with a doctor, run the full panel, not just TSH and T3, T4. You need the full shebang. Um, and there's plenty of functional medicine doctors that can help you with that. Uh, DrWillCole.com. Uh, love Will. He's uh, my Keto Talk co-host. He would be happy to help you. Keep Austin Keto says, please talk about adrenal fatigue, ketosis, and weight loss. Well, do you have specific questions about it? Um, I, uh, me and Christine are currently dealing with adrenal fatigue. It's one reason we're going away on sabbatical for six months. And what I have found uh, is it can make it a little more challenging to have higher levels of ketosis when you are in that state. It also does make it very difficult to lose weight. One thing that I have found since kind of slowing down and trying to heal some of that adrenal fatigue stuff um, is that the uh, weight is coming off and ostensibly the weight is coming off because some of the adrenal fatigue is improving from removing some of the stressors. And I think the fast last week, which Christine was shocked I was able to do a week because with adrenal fatigue, doing long-term fasting can usually be a little more painful because of the lower levels of ketosis. But I think my body is healing um, and it just takes time. You're just gonna have to tinker with it. You're gonna have to uh, slip in times where you try to do some, maybe some longer intermittent fasting. You try to be really strict on keto um, and you get all the benefits. And eventually when you get the benefits, namely insulin lowering effects, you're going to see weight loss happen. Um, if you have more specific questions, I will be happy to answer those. Mary Francis says, for people who want to become keto health coaches, what's the best route to proceed? Oh, if I answer that honestly, I'm going to tick off so many of my favorite people out there. 
I'll just have to try to name off all the programs that I'm aware of. So my friend Maria Emmerich has a really good keto certification program. I know the Keto Evangelist team also has a nice keto coach program. Um, Christine is a nutritional therapy practitioner. So the NTA, Nutritional Therapy Association, uh, would give you letters after your name where you could teach uh, healthy nutrition, definitely with a ketogenic template. Um, I do think that last one is probably one of the better ones because you get letters after your name. It's not explicitly keto, so maybe once keto starts to wane in the culture, you still have this certification that would still be relevant. And in the meantime, you could still start preaching keto. They came to me, the NTA did, a couple of years ago, and they said, hey, keto fits perfectly with what we do. Will, uh, will you start talking about it with, with your people in the keto community? So I have, and a lot of people have responded. Um, and Christine, whenever she sees clients, always talks about keto. Uh, not for everybody. There's some people that, that keto is a contraindication, but for most of them, they have blood sugar issues, they have insulin issues, they have weight issues. Keto works in spades for all those things. So if I had my druthers, I would say definitely look into the NTA, Nutritional Therapy Dot com. Otherwise, if you want a specific keto certification, and there's a bunch of them out there, so I really just ticked off a lot of people. But Maria Emmerich, uh, MariaMindBodyHealth.com is her website. And then Keto Evangelist, KetoEvangelist.com if you want to look into their certification. If you are just joining us, we got an open Q&A session here today. It's been a little while here on Jimmy Rant since I've just opened the floor for you guys to ask any questions you want about keto, cholesterol, fasting, being famous online, podcasting. Maybe you want to ask some questions about my upcoming six-month sabbatical, which I will do a full Jimmy Rants on before I leave. So don't think I'll just like leave and not really talk to you anymore. Uh, August 31st. I got something very special planned for August the 31st. I will not be here in South Carolina. Well, I, I will be in South Carolina, but not here at my home. How's that for a tease? It's going to be really cool the day I say goodbye. Goodbye for six months. Lady Lixel, how often can a person do a seven-day fast safely? Now, the last word you threw in there, Lady Lixel, is the key. You could do a seven-day fast whenever you want. But I think if you're not used to fasting and you want to do a seven-day fast, do a seven-day fast or at least pursue one and see how you do. We just did one uh, and we had a modicum of people of the 2,000 people that, that joined us. We had a modicum of people that stayed to the end. I'd, I'd probably guesstimate it somewhere around 100 people of the 2,000 people made it all the way to the seven days or longer. So once you end a seven-day fast, which a lot of us just did, how long should you wait? I think uh, a minimum of four weeks is probably smart. Um, and I don't even think that everybody needs to do another seven-day fast so soon. I think for most people, doing a seven-day fast uh, a couple times a year, a year is probably going to be fine if you're doing it for the purposes of autophagy, if you're doing it for the purposes of kind of resetting your metabolism, uh, and, you, and you just generally want to be healthy, okay? Those of you that have a little more challenge in your health with insulin resistance, maybe you're having uh, a little more trouble losing weight, maybe a little more trouble getting fasting insulin and blood sugar to come down, you're the ones that need to do it more often. And I think that four to six week, even once a quarter, which would be once every three months, would be a prudent strategy. So it's gonna depend on the person, is the answer, Lady Lixel. Um, I don't think there's any danger if you wait that at least four to six weeks. Um, I can't imagine what the danger would be because you're basically mimicking what hunter-gatherer ancestors would have done. They would have had a big animal kill they would have ate the crap out of the animal kill, uh, preferring the fat first and then uh, and then the protein, the lean meats after that. And once the animal was all consumed, nose to tail, they might go 7, 10, 14 days until the next big animal kill. And then they have the big animal kill and they, have the, and they eat. And then after they're finished eating all that, same thing. It may be a long time before the next animal kill. So biologically we are made to fast now that's so weird for us to think about in 
today's day and age where food availability is everywhere. So it's not weird to do often fast. Now, if you have fasted for seven days and you've gotten good at it and you want to kind of see how your body's going to respond, you might think about doing it within two to three weeks after uh, doing a one week long fast. Not necessarily recommended, but I'm saying it's something you could tinker and test to see. And if you don't respond well, you end the fast and okay, that, that was a dumb idea. I think we've gotten into this prescriptive nature of what we should do when we've forgotten the lost art of trying to tinker and test and figure it out on our own. So I hope that helps you out. Randy says, gained back weight after the fast, but didn't plan breakfast uh, well. I'm struggling with no weight loss. I'm doing one meal a day, eating very little, but I'm satisfied within macros. Why am I not losing? It's a great question. And when someone comes to me and they tell me, hey, I'm doing everything right in my food. I'm eating one meal a day. Uh, everything is on point. I'm eating adequate calories. Make sure that's happening because if you're under eating calories, you will not lose weight. Hear me loud, hear me, hear me proud on that one. You will not lose weight. We answered a question on Keto Talk just last week. Somebody was eating 1,300 calories and they had a massive workout schedule in the gym. I, I said to Will, I said, I think she's under eating calories. He said, she, she said, or he said, she's absolutely under eating calories. So don't under eat calories. That's probably a biggie. But I'm going to shift gears for you and say that it's likely the stress, some stress in your life, um, which could be brought on by sleeplessness. So how are you sleeping? Are you doing, are you sleeping well? What is the stress like in your life? Are you having some, something happen in your family life? Some, something at, at work, something is maybe making your cortisol levels go up which would then make your blood sugar go up, your insulin go up, and your fat loss goal to go down. So don't always put the onus on the food. Don't always kind of micromanage all the macros. Sometimes it's none of that. And I'm the first to tell you uh, it was none of that for me. I've eaten one meal a day, pretty much keto carnivore, uh, all year long. Uh, basically one meal a day. Sometimes I'll have two, but most of the days it's one. And I wasn't losing weight. And I didn't lose weight until May the 1st and since May the 1st where I've slowed down the work I've been doing. And in the slowing down, just slowing down, lowering stress, getting more into doing more meditation, being proactive about lowering all of those things that would be rising the stress in my body. I have to date since May the 1st lost nearly 30 pounds. That's all I've done. Literally all I've done. And all of my food was on point because I'm eating the same food now as I did then. So why am I losing weight now when I wasn't losing weight then and all my macros were right and all my blah, blah, blah and all, all the everything. The, the change, the X factor was the stress and bringing it down. Not saying that's your issue, but I'm saying it's something to consider if you're doing everything right in your food. So if you're just joining us, we have an open Q&A session. Please ask your questions about keto, fasting, cholesterol, um, being famous online, uh, my upcoming sabbatical, whatever you want to ask. Even if you want to ask me a wackadoodle personal question, I might take a stab at it. So try me. Let's see what happens. Kimberly says, dedication to this lifestyle just keeps proving to be very positive. Well, yeah, I think I've been telling you that for a little while. Uh, Richard says, so Jimbo, uh, number one, don't ever call me Jimbo. Uh, there is one person in this world who is allowed to call me Jimbo, and that's my mama. My mama calls me Jimbo, um, but nobody else calls me Jimbo, so yeah word to the wise, Richard. If you wake up uh, with a 0.5 blood ketone or higher, what is that telling you since you personally are getting up uh, and yours is 0.3-ish? Well, it was 0.3-ish today. That doesn't mean it's always 0.3-ish. Um, sometimes I wake up in the morning, it's 0.6. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and it could be 1.1. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and it's 0.2. So it's not always 0.3. It just was today. Sometimes my uh, mine lowers as the day goes on, and I be fasting. Any idea on that? Okay, 
So let me back up. If you wake up at 0.5 or higher, what is that telling you? It's telling you that you are a fat metabolism uh, machine. So kudos, good job. And so if it goes down during the day, this is fascinating, especially in the context of fasting, because you would think I'm not eating. Why are my ketones going down? And I think I have a theory as to why. When you're not consuming food, which when you consume fattier foods, have you ever noticed after you have a fatty meal and you test your blood ketones a modicum of time after, a couple hours after, you're going to have higher ketones. You are. Because that fat you ate gets converted into the body, into a usable source of energy, which is the blood ketones. So when you are fasting, you would think, okay, I'm not eating. It's going to... um, produce higher ketones. Not right away because you're only intermittent fasting uh, and you don't say what day you're fasting, but I'm assuming it's an intermittent fast. Think about it. You're not giving your body raw materials to make ketones, which would be dietary fat. And your body has not been put into a full state of tapping into the stored body fat yet because if it's just an intermittent fast, you still have glycogen stores on your body that that need to be dumped out fully. So when there's still glycogen in your muscles, you're not going to see a higher ketone. The higher ketone tends to jump, if you're going to fast, by the 72 hour mark. Once you hit 72 hours into a fast, you see a huge jump. I went from 0.8 on day one, 2.5 in the middle of day three, and by day four, 5.2. And so, Your body won't tap into that stored body fat to start creating ketones until your body has fully dumped out all of the glycogen stores and whatever remnants of the food that you still had left in your body. So that's how that happens. Kimberly says, I've been doing mostly one meal a day for several months. During the week of the 4th of July, I ate two meals a day. It resulted in weight loss. Is this a good idea to switch it up? Yes, I think your body can get into a state of what's called homeostasis. And people that go to the gym will tell you this. You never work the same muscles in the same way constantly all the time. I know there's some some people, they'll go to the gym and they'll go on some machine and they do that same motion on their body every time that they go. And then they wonder, okay, they get a modicum of strength gain, but then it stops and they wonder, what in the world am I doing wrong? I was feeling stronger and then suddenly the strength gain stopped. Well, homeostasis kicked in. Your body adapted to whatever it was, uh, whatever you were doing. So for you, Kimberly, eating one meal a day, your body probably got used to it and adjusted to it. And when you switch things up and went two meals a day and you saw the weight loss, your body's like, oh, we're doing something different now? Okay, you're gonna change it up, Kimberly, okay. All right, let's see a little whoosh in weight loss. And I say you you do maybe a week of two of two meals a day, followed by a week of one meal a day, followed by a week of two meals a day, followed by, you see where I'm going here? So change it up. And if it's working for you, do what works for you. Uh, G Fitness says, how do you respond to non-keto people? How is all that fat and red meat okay for your arteries? Oh, well, number one, I tell them, read my book. I wrote a whole book about it called Cholesterol Clarity. And I think sometimes we get uh, all these myths that have been out there about fat and cholesterol. And people still don't understand it. And it's, it's not acceptable anymore. My question back to those people is, why, why do you believe that fat and meat is somehow harmful to my arteries. And you have the conversation and they'll come back and say, oh, well, we know it clogs arteries. And so use it as an educational opportunity. You know, actually, uh, science has shown that's simply not true, that the arteries don't get clogged from consuming fat. The arteries don't get clogged from consuming red meat. What clogs the arteries is when you have inflammation that happens in those arteries and it's that inflammation which causes some of these uh, scabs to start happening in the arteries, then the cholesterol that's in the body goes to try to put that inflammation out. 
And in the process of putting the inflammation out, you start getting scabs and scabs and scabs. And that is what clogs the arteries. But what causes the inflammation that would lead to the scabs? It's not saturated fat. It's not red meat. It's carbs and vegetable oils. So you have the conversation. If they open the door, you walk through it. So it means you need to have your game on, your A game on with all these talking points, what this stuff is. Definitely, if you want to educate yourself, get cholesterol clarity and keto clarity. I wrote those books, guys, specifically to make this easy to understand and easy to talk to, to people that just don't understand keto. Sharon says, in Disney since Sunday after our seven-day fast, not doing horrible but not as good with Christmas or keto Christmas, I thought. <laughs> I did have some carbs, so wondering if I should lower my fat for now uh, or just back to straight, strict keto. Well, if you had carbs, that's okay. I think you're enjoying yourself at Disney. That's wonderful. And Sharon, don't beat yourself up about it. I'd say if you want to get back on plan again, one of the best strategies is go back strict keto, low carb, moderate protein, high fat, with long periods of intermittent fasting. So maybe you come back from it, you have one meal in the middle of the day, you make it a substantial low carb, moderate protein, high fat meal, and then don't eat for 18 to 24 hours. And then have another meal the next day. So start doing the whole OMAD. And I would even say if you're feeling well enough, once you kind of do that a bit, maybe try alternate day fasting because that would push the uh, push the feeding window maybe about 40 to 48 hours, somewhere in that range. And it would allow you to really dump the, gly the glycogen stores from all those carbs you ate. So that would be my strategy to try to get back into this. Sue B says, I find it hard to order at Mexican restaurants. Oh, no, 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 no. Mexican is one of my favorite places to eat. Now, you've got to be very savvy. She wants to know if I have any suggestions. We have here in Spartanburg, South Carolina, if you ever come here, we're going out to eat at my favorite Mexican place. It's authentic California uh, Mexican, California-style Mexican. And they have this dish there. Uh, everybody and every Mexican joint has this uh, fajitas so that, you know, they bring it out on the big platter and it's so they have this one called California fajitas and it's not just fajitas, which is the meat and the vegetables and guys at this place, some of the Mexican restaurants, the vegetables are kind of mushy and gross and it's onions and, ugh, and green peppers. It's just mushy. It's gross at this place that we go to locally. They put fresh uh, zucchini, fresh squash, along with green peppers and onions and all that stuff. And then you get to choose your meat. I usually get steak in there, uh, but they have chicken and they have pork and, and different things and shrimp. In the California style, they put cheese all over the top and spicy jalapeno bacon. Yeah, I love Mexican. So what do you do? Here's how you order it. I want a naked fajita without beans, without rice, and don't bring the chips to the table. So when you get a naked fajita without beans, without rice, and don't bring chips to the table, you take away all the culprit carbs, okay? Uh, and no tortillas, they'll, they'll offer tortilla, no tortillas. They give you usually guacamole, which is perfectly fine, and sour cream. So when you tell them, I don't need chips, I don't need uh, rice. I don't need uh, any of the wraps uh, that will put it in, no tortillas um, and no refried beans. You sweet talk them a little bit. You know, I'm not getting any of that stuff. Really not. Um, can you throw me some extra sour cream and some extra guacamole? I have never had one turn me down. When you turn all that other stuff down and all you're asking for is a little extra sour cream and guacamole, they're going to do it for you. Sometimes there'll be a hard butt about it and you just say, okay, I'll pay the whatever, 50 cents. But sweet talk them a little bit and uh, you can get that. That's my favorite thing to order. You could probably make other things like a big burrito um, that they sell or whatever, just remove 
all the culprit carbs and they'll bring you a platter. You might even say, hey, I eat this thing called keto. I love the meat and the cheeses and what can I order? And they might customize you something as well. That has also happened for me. But if you get the naked fajitas, uh, that tends to fill the bill for Mexican. L. Landry wants to know, so when's the next seven day fast? So I assume you're referring to the corporate challenge of when I'm going to do it together with you guys. So I have a bunch of travel coming up and my last trip, uh, which will be my last kind of public appearance at an event is going to be at the great Canadian keto event happening in Toronto, Ontario, Canada on Saturday, August 17th. I'm still working out the details of when we're flying home. If we fly home on that Sunday, then we will start the fast on that Monday, uh, corporately, Monday the 19th. So I haven't heard back when I'm flying home yet. I don't want to start this flying home because that puts my body in a stressful state. And that's the last thing you want when you're trying to uh, to do a fast. And I, and I can't you know, come on live and be here if I'm flying in an airplane that day. So to be determined, but it will be before I leave on my sabbatical. So even if we start on that Tuesday, the 20th, we will start it. It will be over before I leave on August 31st. So that would be my last day. Uh, Davila says 67 hours fasting. First time ever. Totally impossible, but without you and your YouTube videos. Thank you. Well, wow. That's awesome. 67 hours. That's incredible. Sam says, my doctor says she can't like the diet, but she loves the results except for my LDL is up. <sighs> Yet another that qualifies to read cholesterol clarity. Because we explain why LDL is up. And we explain why LDLC is a big old, I don't give a crap what it means. It doesn't mean anything. It's sad that we still live in this day and age where that is coming out of the mouths of doctors. And it's at that point, you got to realize you've got to take control of your own health. And you have. You've gone keto, Sam. And you've changed your triglyceride to HDL ratio, which I assume is extremely good. You can't fix stupid. And I think it's irresponsible of any doctor who pretends like they're about health of their patients. I'm in full-on Jimmy Rant mode. Pretends like they are in uh, the know about all things health and you don't know or care about keto, I'm sorry, unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable with all these people doing keto and telling their doctor about it and you saying uh, and, and saying it to your doctor and, oh, I can't like the diet. I would have the conversation. What is wrong with the diet, especially the diet that's giving me the numbers and the results that you like. Fire them up. <laughs> Val says, Dr. Barry gave the link to download the new guidelines recently too. Uh, he's talking about, you're talking about the ADA guidelines, the American Diabetes Association, where they do now recommend low carb diets. Pretty cool. He said to print them off and give to your doctor. Yeah, you should. L. Andrew says, my trigs are 48. I'm stoked. All my doctor wanted to talk about is my total cholesterol of 282. Yeah. That is the paradigm, sadly. But again, I feel for doctors because standard of care, they ha they basically get in trouble if they don't pay attention to your total cholesterol and your LDL. That is what the standard of care for cholesterol is. And if they don't pay attention to a cholesterol, total cholesterol over 200 or a LDL cholesterol over 100, they can get dinged and maybe have their medical license pulled. So I am very conscientious of that. And I want you to be too. But the way you work with your doctor is, okay, they want to prescribe you a medication to lower it. Okay, when you reject it, you are dinged on your file as a non-compliant patient. Take the prescription from them and rip it up if you so choose to do that. There is no law that requires you that if you get a prescription from a doctor that you have to fill that prescription. Patients have to know this. You're the boss. And if you're the boss and that doctor is merely a consultant in your health and they happen to give you something, advice, meaning a prescription for the drug, you fulfill their standard of care by taking the prescription you fulfill your own desire by throwing it away, 
And remember, you make that decision. That's your choice, not your doctor's choice. Lisa said, uh, would calcium buildup in kidneys be affected by ketosis? Would a long-term Atkins diet cause this? Love being in ketosis, by the way. So <clears throat> it's a little above my pay grade because that is a medical condition that I don't want to commentate on just in general. I can't imagine what uh, would be about ketosis that would cause um, a calcium buildup in your kidneys. Calcium gets shuttled to places it doesn't need to be shuttled to when your balance of vitamin D um, and K2 are off. So if you have uh, lower levels of vitamin D and K2, then calcium can start depositing in areas it doesn't need to be. For a lot of people, it's the coronary arteries. For other people, like this condition, your uh, nephrocalcinosis, the calcium buildup in your kidneys, uh, in the kidneys. So I don't think it necessarily has anything to do with ketosis per se. It could be some of these micronutrients, specifically vitamin D levels, get those tested. Uh, vitamin D3 is what you're uh, testing. Um, and then uh, test uh, also your K2 levels and just see where you stand. Uh, Shinobi says, I'm trying to do a seven day fast for the first time. What's advice to help with being tired and other side effects? So I just did, and general advice, Shinobi, I just did two weeks worth of content that we put all in one place. So go grab a pen and paper real quick, write down this URL. We have great content that answers all of those questions literally here on Jimmy Rants the last two weeks. Uh, before this week, that's all I did was talk about fasting. So go to jimmyrance.com slash fasting challenge. Once you're there, you're going to see all kinds of videos. We talked about the myths of fasting. We talked about how to do fasting, you know, how to handle situations, blah, blah, blah. And then we went right through seven days every single day, twice a day. I did updates. You're going to feel like I'm there with you in real time as you're going through this fast. So please go watch those videos, jimmyrance.com slash fasting challenge. We're gonna use that again when I come back with the one week fast at the end of August. So uh, there you go. All right. Val says, I've been keto for two years, haven't checked ketones lately. I checked this afternoon, blood glucose was 86. Ketones said low. Could stress cause this? Just checked again, it's 0.1. Stress can cause low ketones, by the way. But it could be what I talked about this morning. Do you feel well? Do you have hunger control? Is your mind um, uh, and mood under control? Are you seeing brain health benefits where you feel really sharp? Uh, are you super energetic? If you have all these positive effects of ketosis and yet you're popping a 0.1 and you've got blood glucose at 86, which is really, really good. If all of those things are happening, it could be what I talked about in my post earlier on Instagram. Go read that from this morning where I explain why lower ketones in the context of all those good things happening in your body could be a good thing. It could be that you are using almost exactly the number of ketones you're producing. The goal on the blood ketone meter is not higher and higher numbers. The goal on the meter is, are you getting ketones spilling into the blood to be used as energy? So the fact that you have 0.1, and again, I don't know about all those symptoms that I said, are you feeling full? Are you getting the satiety? Are you getting the mental clarity and the energy and all those things? If you are, and your 86 blood sugar is a great indication you probably are, then that 0.1 isn't a big deal. I would dare say later in the day that 0.1 will go up. It tends to do that. Um, so no, nothing to worry about. Randy wants to know, talk about plateaus down to OMAD uh, within macro criteria, not losing for a month. Yeah, I answered your question a little bit earlier. So don't ask the question twice, guys. I'm not missing it. I'm just scrolling down. So Rick says, have you heard of the snake diet? Yeah, I think Cole is the most disgusting human being in the entire world. I am not a fan of the guy. I don't think you have to be that profane. You don't have to yell at people. I know I do a show called Jimmy Rants and I do yell from time to time, but no, 
I, I mean, he might have some incredible uh, things that he has to say, but I can't cut through all the MFs and the GDs and the, no, I, you don't have to do all that. If you have to do that to get people to pay attention to you on social media, I'm sorry, you're not my people. And if, and if he's your people, um, I don't know why you watch Jimmy Rants because I am the antithesis of Cole Robinson, I promise you. Um, yeah, so no, I'm not a fan of him. Now, his protocols are probably fine. From what I've heard um, of what he's about, he's probably got some good stuff. But I just can't for the life of me get over all of the, the charade that he puts on just to get his point across. So, no thank you. Keto Mac, over the journey, uh, which guest has had the most profound impact and effect on your thinking? Oh, oh, over my journey for 15 years. I've had 1,500 plus episodes of the Living a Vita Low Carb Show. Over the journey, which guest has had the most profound effect? I won't limit it to one guest. There's no way, Mac, I could do that. I, with every podcast I've ever done, my goal is, even with the vegans that I have on, my goal is always, what can I learn from this person? Is there something I can learn? And what I've come to the conclusion of, every single guest I've ever had, every single one, I've learned something from. And you pull that nugget, and you pull that nugget, and you pull that nugget, and you pull that nugget. And then it becomes knowledge that I then can disseminate to you guys here on Jimmy Rants, in, uh, you know, when I'm live and in person and doing Q&A sessions. Um, so I won't limit it to one. I don't think that's fair to all those people. Um, there's been some fantastic guests over the years. Um, and there's been some crappy guests over the years. But even the crappy ones, I try to learn something from all of them. G Fitness, how do I respond to the non-keto? You guys, don't answer your, don't ask your questions twice. I'm not missing it. I'm just scrolling up. So if you've asked the question, please do not ask again. Um, Miss Chris says, how can I explain to my daughter and his fiance or her fiance who are vegetarians that red meat is good for you? They're convinced it causes cancer. Well, none of the red meat studies that have been done are randomized controlled trials. So the question you might ask, and it might blow their minds, they may not have, know how to answer, but if they're really into the science and they really want to show you science that proves red meat causes cancer, ask them, okay, you believe that, wonderful. Give me the randomized control clinical trial that shows it. When they produce you the evidence that they do, there is no randomized control clinical trial that shows it. There are epidemiological studies that show associations. Well, associations aren't causation. So, that's how you handle it. You explain to them, okay, well, in the lack of evidence, real, scientific, solid evidence that red meat causes cancer, there is no evidence. That's the evidence. And, of course, every vegan is going to say, well, epidemiological evidence is evidence. Well, no, it's not. Epidemiological evidence, which is where you observe other studies and look at data points, not people, um, it, it will form a hypothesis to test in a randomized control clinical trial. And to date, none of those have been done. The vegans have no motivation to get out there and do a randomized control clinical trial testing this because they know there is no harmful effect that comes from red meat. There's not. Yet they don't want to do the study. And I say put up or shut up. If you believe it causes cancer, show it to me. We ain't seen it yet. Uh, M. Man says also Mexican bacon wrapped shrimp. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Donnell, what's the quickest way to get back into ketosis after two weeks of carbs? Well, don't do it quick. That's that's the number one thing I would say. Don't do it quick. But like I answered somebody earlier, super strict keto and long periods of intermittent fasting and maybe even throw in there once you start getting all the, the glycogen stores dumped from all that carbs, um, maybe do some extended fasting of at least 72 hours to kind of really get going. 
B. Parkman, the fajitas I get come with guacamole salad as well as rice and beans. I just tell them no rice and beans, double the guac, and they are fine. Yes, that's right. Sue B. said, my friend's doctor told her if she keeps her A1C under 7, she's fine and not diabetic. That's wrong, isn't it? No. Um, uh, doctors. Um, if she wants to be healthy, it needs to be below 5.5. And if you eat keto, it gets below 5.5 five pretty easy, even for someone with type 2 diabetes. Under 7, once it's over 6.0, damage is being done. 5.5 five is considered uh, like 5.7 uh, to 6, like that pre-diabetic range. Under 7, 6.9 is not healthy. 6.5 is not healthy. 6.1, not healthy. Get it below 5.5 five, and keto gets you there. The reason your friend's doctor says that is they know that those drugs won't necessarily get it down to that range. So they say, oh, we'll just get it under seven because they know the drugs might do that. And they feel better about themselves. The patient thinks they're doing something good and they're not. Get it down below five, five, keto is the way. Lavender storm, is keto safe for long-term uh, way of eating? Why wouldn't it be? It is the diet of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. We survived and became modern humans because people ate in a state of nutritional ketosis with mostly low-carb, moderate-protein, high-fat, and periods of fasting. So why do we think it would not be a long-term way of eating today when we have the same genetic makeup as our hunter-gatherer ancestors? It's kind of a silly question, but thank you for asking it. Um, Gerald says, so far I haven't been counting calories, been doing carnivore. I can't finish my food like my body tells me to stop. That is why I like eating once a day, uh, once a day with it just uh, feeling less hunger. That's great. That is a good sign. Uh, Gerald says, do you still keep in contact with Jason Fung? Like you guys are still good friends. I, I'm not an enemy of Jason Fung, if that's what you're asking. Uh, we did write a book together, The Complete Guide to Fasting. So there's his name, there's my name. We did write a book together. He is a very busy man with his practice, so we don't we don't chat like buds every day on the phone, but I do stay in contact with him. He's written some blurbs for the back of my books. Um, and yeah, he's doing his own podcast, a low-carb doc podcast now. Um, yeah, so we don't talk regularly, but we're not enemies. Uh, there's a lot of us in this space that we stay in contact through social media and we tag each other in posts. And while we may not necessarily talk every day, um, we are still comrades in this fight against carbosis. Um... Alicia says, I was off keto for two weeks. After two days, ketones are 0.09. Yeah, that could happen if you get right back on it again. Your your keto metabolism is still there. People say, oh, I've been, I blew it, so it's going to take forever. It actually comes back pretty quick. All right, so it's been a while, guys. I'm glad we were able to do this open Q&A session for you. And so thank you for all the wonderful questions. We will get this up on YouTube for all the YouTubers to check out on my Jimmy Rants page there. And that's it for this episode of Jimmy Rants. JimmyRants.com is the website. And if you want to engage live in the content, you got to go follow me over on Instagram live. I'm at living low carb man, L-I-V-I-N-L-O-W-C-A-R-B-M-A-N. Once you're there, you can engage live just like all these people did here today. Thank you guys for being here on Jimmy Rants. Uh, if you missed the live, you can watch it on replay for up to 24 hours. After 24 hours, it does disappear. Pop on over to YouTube, type in a keyword search Jimmy Rants or youtube.com slash live in low carb man. Finally, the best of the best moments of this here show is in podcast form. It's the Jimmy Rants podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. All of these links, you guys, are at jimmyrants.com. So until next time, we'll see you then. <laughs>